Welcome back everybody. This is Rob from Crown of Thorns for our Sunday Bible study video. Um, I'm filming three videos today. Um, if you've already watched the one that um, came out on Thursday, um, The Love of Jesus, then you'll know already that I'm uh, recording three videos today. That one, this one, and then I'm doing one for my other channel as well. Hence the same outfit. All right, because I'm filming all of them on the same day. Today is Tuesday, the 29th of June. So another busy week, um, another busy weekend. Um, it's like that in the summer for me. That's when my business really picks up. So I try to get as much done in each day as I can. So three videos today I'll be filming. And this one is going to be about when and why I got saved. And I was uh, hesitant to do a video like this because I don't ever want for these videos, for this channel, or whatever else to be about me. It should always be about God. I want it to be about God, first and foremost, always, okay? But, we can use our own testimony as a witnessing tool. We should, okay? Especially if you're new to the faith yourself. If you are a new Christian, and maybe you haven't had a whole lot of time to dig into the Bible yet, you can use your own testimony as a way to get others saved, to get people to come to Jesus. Now you have to have some Bible knowledge, and we've talked about this before, you need to know who Jesus is and what he did. Now you have to know that in order to get saved or for other people to get saved. We need to know who Jesus is, God in the flesh. Okay, what he did, he died on a cross. Died, he was buried, and then he resurrected. Okay, you need to know that. What else? Well, he died, yes, but he couldn't have just died anyway. It couldn't have been a death without blood. Remember Hebrews 9.22, without the remission of, I'm sorry, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So, we are to trust on the shed blood of Jesus. That is how you get saved. So if you know at least that much and you have your testimony, you can get other people here. Okay? Um, these are the verses that we go to at every Bible study video I do. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 encapsulates everything I just said. That is the means by which we are saved, the gospel by which we are saved. Romans 3.25, um, the shedding blood, the blood that was shed of Jesus. That is how we get saved. In Ephesians 1.13, once you're saved, you're always saved. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Everlasting or eternal life. If you could lose your salvation, it would be temporary. Okay? But it's not. Thank God. It's everlasting. It's eternal. So, even though I was hesitant to do a video like this because I don't like to talk about me, okay? But I am going to use this about me as a means by which I hope to get other people saved. Because you can give Bible verses, you can give great examples, and I'm not against that at all. I mean, that's what this whole channel is about. But when you can tell somebody how something, whatever it may be, how it personally affected you, that um, is, is probably one of the strongest ways to influence someone. It's kind of like testimonials for a product, word of mouth, okay? If you like a particular product, okay? Uh, in the last video, I was drinking that Hint water. It tastes good, but it's filtered water, purified water. And it leaves, purified water always leaves my mouth feeling dry. Spring water is the best way to go. Anyway, this here, this is a good soda, and I don't know if I'm allowed to show the actual brand, so I won't. But I could, you know, they can advertise all they want to, and hopefully that's effective. But to convince someone to buy this product, I know for me is if I can talk to someone else who's used the product and they have positive things to say about it, that really speaks volumes. So of course this company is going to talk up their product. They're going to make a commercial and tell you 
how badly this sucks. They're going to say, oh, it's the worst thing we've ever made. You'll probably hate it, but please buy it anyway. I, I mean, I don't think it would work. That's not good marketing. So, of course, the company itself will hype their own product. That just makes sense. But I'm telling you that this is really good soda. Really good soda. It's a craft soda. It's all natural. I like that. So, somebody might be more inclined to buy that because they can say, oh, well, Rob's tried that. And he liked it, and he said it is good. That's that's someone that I personally know, and based on that recommendation, I'll buy the product. Same thing here. We can we can give Bible verses, and we should. We should talk about everything that Jesus has done. We should. But when you can give your own personal testimony, that is an endorsement that people who know you can say, "I know that person personally. I know they wouldn't lie." I know they wouldn't lead me astray. I'm gonna listen. Maybe I'm gonna check this thing out that they're talking about, and I'm hoping that's what my story will do. Um, I'm gonna divulge a lot of information, and again, I don't like to talk about this kind of stuff, but the good and the bad is what brought me to where I am right now, okay? I will leave some details out only to protect others, okay? Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna mention other people's names. But there's obviously interaction. We all interact with people. But I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna divulge too much that could, you know, incriminate or upset or whatever else somebody else. But as far as me, you know, no holds barred. All right. So, when and why I got saved? Well, the why is gonna take a lot longer than the when. All right. And most people will say I got saved because. And the obvious reason is because I don't want to go to hell. I want to spend eternity in heaven with God. But but there's a whole bunch of stuff that brings you to that realization. Okay? A lot of people will say, well, I got saved because when I got saved, even though my life didn't get easier, I had comfort. I had joy. And I knew that no matter what comes my way, I have this. I have Jesus. I have God. Okay? So there's personal experiences that we can now relay to others, okay? So I'm gonna to cut to one part uh, as to when I got saved, all right? I, I just give that away right, right, right now. And I remember it clearly, so uh, I'm going to put it here. March 11th, 2013. March 11, 2013. That is the day that I got saved. That's the day that I finally got to the point where I was no longer going to live my way. I was turning it over to God. I was gonna let Him take the lead. I was gonna let Him take control, all right? I'm gonna make sure my camera's on. It is, okay. Again, that's my OCD. I think I might have talked about that before. Did I really lock the door? I better check. Same thing with the camera. Anyway, uh, March 11, 2013. That's when um, I died, so to speak, and was born again in Christ. Okay, the old me was on, was gone. First uh, uh, Corinthians 5:17, I think it is. Let's take a look. First Corinthians. Five. No, I'm sorry, it's 2 Corinthians. I always get that mixed up. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you get saved, uh, the Holy Spirit moves in, you become a new creature. Now, it's not, you're still able to sin. You still will sin because you still have this flesh. There's an old nature and a new nature, and they're both in there and they're battling, battling back and forth. One wants you to uh, follow the world or follow your fleshly desires or to give in to the temptations of the devil. The new creature, though, is saying, no, 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 stick here. Stay with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you if you'll listen. All right, 
So when you get saved, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, that was the verse that stuck with me. Because I knew that happened. That happened to me. I'm warring. There's this old me. I still want to do some of these things. But there's this new me that's saying, no, no, no. Don't do it. Don't give in. Now, sometimes I fail. Sometimes I do. But for the most part, okay, if I stay focused, I'm good. I just, you know, saved. Salvation. Holy Spirit. So 2 Corinthians 5.17, I love that verse, all right? So let me back up, obviously, a little bit. So this is the day that I got saved. This is when I was born, and I don't like to give that out too much either, because uh, that's a long time ago, 1974. But it is what it is. That's the day I got born, all right? It, or that's the year I was born. Um, the day and all that doesn't matter. I have two birthdays. Just so you know, I have the day that I was actually physically born, and then I have the day that I was born again. So I have two birthdays. If you are saved, then you have two birthdays. If you get saved, you will also have two birthdays. Okay? This is when I was born into the family of God. This is the more important date to me. Okay? But anyway, I was born in 1974. All right. Um, raised by my parents. Um, spent a lot of time with my grandparents, who... Um, were probably the biggest influence on me as far as um, the Bible, all right, in, in, in praying and at least having a knowledge of God and a knowledge of Jesus, okay? And for a long time, I thought that was enough. I thought that was enough. And, and I don't want to, again, blame my grandparents. They, they, they did well. But I don't think that I was ever taught the true meaning of salvation. Or I, mean, I didn't even hear about salvation until much later in my life. And, and, and again, I don't know if my grandparents eventually got their own salvation worked out. I hope so. No, they, they, they read their Bible. They, I believe they loved God as much as they could. But I never remember them ever talking about getting saved. In fact, they were of the, the opinion that um, to get to heaven, you just have to do good things. You have to do good things. Do good things, and if your good outweighs your bad, then you'll go to heaven. Kind of like, uh, uh, you know, the list that Santa Claus makes. And for a long while, for a long while, that's what I believed. So long as I'm a good person, I'm trying, I'm doing the best I can, I didn't kill anyone. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. I believe in God. Yeah. So, and I tell you, the grace of God just extends so far because I think about all the dumb things I did as a kid. Dangerous things. You know, I remember having a motorcycle and just flying along the back roads. We lived out in the country. I mean, 85, 90 miles per hour. And I was probably 16, 17 years old. Age of accountability had definitely, I was past that. And I never wore a helmet or anything like that. Just cruising along these back roads, up and down these hills and whatever else. Gravel roads. And I think, you know what? In my own mind, I thought, well, if I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person. I believe in God. But I wouldn't have. Had I died at 16 or 17 years old, being a fool on that motorcycle, I'd be in hell right now burning. I'd be in hell right now burning. Even as I got older, okay, I would stray even farther. So uh, let me back up a little bit. But I never heard about salvation. Never heard the term, are you saved? Okay. And we went, excuse me, when I say we, I mean myself and my sister, my youngest sister hadn't been born yet, and my mom, because my dad was always working. But we went to an Assembly of God church. Yeah, so, again, it was perpetuated and emphasized to me, well, you have to do good things if you want to go to heaven. And so, it, it, again, compounded with what my grandparents had told me, on top of that, now I'm going to a church, and I'm just young, seven, eight years old, going to an Assembly of God church and being told that if you do bad things, you're going to hell. And if you do good things, you'll go to heaven. And if you do 
do something bad, you better, you better, you better ask forgiveness right now. You know, and you better pray. You better hope God forgives you. Better hope that God forgives you. That's why I have such a strong disdain for those kinds of churches. I remember being probably six or seven years old and being in the Sunday school class. And No, I was nine. I take that back. I was nine years old. Why do I know that? Because um, I had just received the first Quiet Riot album, Metal Health, and that came out in 1983. So I was nine years old. I loved Quiet Riot. I loved a lot of music, okay? Still do. And I had posters on my wall. I mean, a lot of kids had that, you know, posters of Kiss and Motley Crue and Quiet Riot. And again, I'm not condoning everything that they stand for or that they do, but I don't hold this rigid view that you can't listen to secular music. I think you just have to be, uh, you know, careful. Just, you know, discern which ones are okay, which ones are not. Anyway, so I had posters on my wall. And I remember the Sunday school teachers telling me at nine years old, would you put those posters up in a church? And of course I was like, I don't know, why not? And I remember her telling me that I was gonna to go to hell because I had those posters on my wall. And that put the fear, not the fear of God, it just put fear in me, okay? That was the type of instruction that I had at that point, okay? Again, my grandparents did well in that they introduced me to the Bible. They introduced me to God, okay? And, and my parents did as well, too. Um, but I spent so much time with my grandparents that that was where I heard it a lot. My grandfather was very wise, and he was smart, and he, he, um, he knew his Bible. The problem was is that he also had a personal bias. So a lot of times he would use the Bible as a means to perpetuate his own personal view and take things out of context. Now, I didn't know it then, but I know it now, okay? And again, I, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, disparage anybody, so I, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of details about that, but looking back on it now, that was where I was at as I was growing up. Good works will get you to heaven, bad deeds, you're going to hell. And again, that was my mentality. And so I, I carried that throughout most of my life, okay? And so growing up, um, I think I walked a pretty good line. I never got into a whole lot of trouble. Um, I tried to do good things. Uh, one, just to be a good person, but two, because again, I was doing that whole Santa's list, you know, checklist, do my goods outweigh my bad, okay? And at any point in time, like I said, if I would have died then, in fact, any time before this point right here, I would be burning in hell. I would be in hell right now. That's a scary thought, but again, the grace of God. And that's why, you know, when people talk about, man, when is Jesus coming back? I wish he'd just come back now. And, and yes, I'm looking forward to when Christ comes back too, but let's not be selfish. There are still a lot of people who are not saved and Jesus is waiting. He wants for as many people to get saved as possible, okay? And I keep thinking, well, you know what? I know people have been wanting Jesus to come back for a long time, and, and that's good. But what if Jesus would have come back just one day before this? It wouldn't have worked out so well for me or a lot of other people. So yes, I am anxiously awaiting for Jesus to rapture us out of here. Looking forward to it. Cannot wait. But I also know Jesus will come when he know, knows that the, the time is right. There's still other people that need to get saved. Okay? So, I thank God that he didn't come already. At least on my behalf. Okay? So, growing up, that was my mentality. And because of that mentality, um, you really don't have a true appreciation for what Jesus did on the cross. because I didn't even know about salvation and therefore I couldn't appreciate what salvation was and why Jesus did what he did. I knew that Jesus died on a cross and I'd heard the term, well, he died for your sins. And I understood it, but I didn't really, it didn't have a, an emotional gravity for me, okay? It was just head knowledge and that's the difference. When you get saved, it can't just be the head knowledge. It has come from here, okay? But 
everything that I knew about God in the Bible, even the limited amount that I did know, was all up here. I knew of it, but I didn't know it. Okay? Big difference. So, as I'm getting older, uh, without that foundation, without understanding what salvation is, when you're just basing it off, am I doing good or bad, you can easily make excuses when you do bad. Because you say, well, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as what Joe did. Did you hear what Joe did? You know, did you hear what Mary's been doing? I didn't do anything like that. Yes, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm doing these bad things. But it's not as bad as what Joe and Mary are doing. It was that type of mentality. Therefore, it's easy to make excuses for your sin. It's easy to make excuses when you can, uh, in your own mind, compare it to what other people are doing and minimize your own. And that's what I was doing. That's what I was doing, okay? So, I, I, but for the most part, I did pretty well as a kid. And I made a few notes here, just some stuff I wanna touch on. But I was never really saved. I never got saved, okay? So, with that in mind, even though I did well as I was growing up, I never got into a whole lot of trouble, all right? I went off to college and I still pretty well told the line. I knew that I wanted to, you know, get, get in, do what I needed to do and get out, okay? And, but had I had a stronger foundation for my faith, a stronger knowledge of what salvation and what Jesus did, if I would have had all of that, then I would not have gone to the college I went to, which was MSU. I went to MSU um, in 1993. I graduated in May of 93, and by August, September, whenever college started up, I was at MSU. And like I said, if I had really had my my faith where it should have been, I would have gone to a Christian college, a good Christian college, rather than going to MSU. Now I learned a lot at MSU, not just educational, but also because I grew up in a small town, going to a place like MSU, I was exposed to a whole just a diverse group of people, um, not just, you know, uh, different races and different cultures and backgrounds. It was good in that respect. The flip side, though, the downside to all of it was because I didn't have a strong biblical foundation, I fell. I fell hard when I was at MSU. Okay, I never tasted alcohol until I was 21. I was adamantly opposed to drugs and alcohol of any kind. I didn't want any part of it. But when I got here and everyone else was doing it and I saw how much fun they were having, okay, well, I thought, well, it can't be that bad. And again, it was that rationale that, you know, yeah, I'm drinking, but it's not like what Frank is doing. You know, Frank's out there uh, stealing cars. So I'm good. I'm not as bad as Frank, so I'm still going to heaven. I believe in God. And I know Jesus died on a cross. Yippee. I'm good. So, because I didn't have true knowledge, not just in the head, but in my heart, it became easy to fall. And I did. I started drinking. And the problem for me is that it got to a point where I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop. I was drinking five or six days a week. And I don't just mean like, you know, a beer or a couple of beers. I'm talking about like the whole Budweiser truck pulled up in my front yard and I just emptied it. Okay. I'm exaggerating, of course, but I'm just saying I was drunk a lot to the point where some things I don't even recall, don't even remember. Um, but I still, it became a problem for me. So I had that. I, now I have this problem with alcohol. I'm, I'm lacking in my faith. Even the little bit that I knew okay, I've walked away from, and now you compound that with alcohol, all right, so I graduate college, and um, by 1998, okay, 1998, I'm living in Grand Rapids, and I'm working at the bank, working at the bank, so at this point, uh, um, I'm living in a bigger city, so there's a lot more to do, and I'm working at a bank, which means 
and I was doing like loans, mortgages, things like that. I had lots, lots, I mean lots of money. Now, because I didn't have a strong foundation in faith, and I didn't know anything about being saved, and I didn't know, uh, I, 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 you know, I had a Bible. And every now and again, I'd pick it up and try to read it, and then I'd just get bored and be like, I don't get it. And of course I didn't get it, because I wasn't saved. And if you're not saved, you're not going to understand your Bible. So I would get bored with it, and I'd set it down and just let dust collect on it. All right, but what was funny is that I still had this mentality of, well, I'm a Christian, because my parents were Christians, my grandparents are Christians, Therefore, I'm a Christian. And then I would later find out that God doesn't have grandchildren. Meaning, you're not just born into Christianity. You have to get saved on your own, okay? By your own volition, I mean, in order to get saved. But I figured, well, my parents are Christians, my grandparents are Christians. I must be a Christian too, okay? And so, I would, I would, I would act like a Christian sometimes, okay? I would, I would condemn other people for their sins, but refuse to acknowledge my own. That's called a hypocrite, okay? Um, I would, if I didn't, I would use the Bible to my advantage is what I'm getting at. And I would take things out of context to support my own argument. And, and here's the thing is, I would quote certain scriptures even though I had no understanding of what it really meant. And I couldn't even tell you where to find the scripture. No idea, okay? It could be something like, uh, you know, oh, you're not supposed to swear. And, and, and now I read, I know in Colossians 3, 8, it says, you know, no filthy communication should proceed from your mouth. But I couldn't, I didn't know that back then. But because I didn't like to hear other people swear, I would use that against them. Now, eventually I developed quite the bad mouth myself, okay? And I, certain words that would fly out of my mouth is repulsive to me now. But I was a part of that, all right? So I'm drinking, I have a lot of money, I'm working at a bank, I'm in Grand Rapids. I have really zero, zero foundation for anything, okay? So of course, again, I can justify my sin because it's not as bad as Frank, it's not as bad as Susan, okay? And my mentality is so long as I'm doing good things too, and so long as those good things outnumber the bad things, and I'm going to go to heaven. I'm okay. I'm good. I believe in God, and I'm still doing good stuff. Yeah, I'm drinking. Yes, I am being a jerk because this, having a lot of money, pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance. We'll see more of that later. But I became very proud, very arrogant. I had money, and it made me have an inflated ego, okay? Not only that, but I pretty much, like I said, I told the line pretty well throughout high school and kind of part of college, okay? But at this point, um, I, wanted, I wanted more. I wanted more. And so through a series of different girlfriends and people that I only knew for one night, and I don't want to get into that too much, but I became the very thing that I was always told not to be. And that's somebody that sleeps around, a fornicator, okay? I knew that the Bible said not to do that, that you're supposed to wait for marriage. I knew that. But, again, I could justify my own uh, fornicating because, again, it's not as bad as Larry, who's at the strip club, okay? I'm not doing that. It's not as bad as Susan, who's, uh, you know, uh, smoking crack. I'm not that bad, so I'm okay. I'm still going to heaven. I believe in God. I know this Jesus guy. He did something on a cross for me. Yay. And, and, and I think my good still outweighs my bad. I'm all right. And, and it was that kind of a mentality. Again, um, I would have no part in church. Now, see, here's the thing. Even though I wish way back here somebody would have explained to me this concept of salvation, what it means to truly get saved, or what salvation even meant, okay? I can't blame the people who maybe didn't know for themselves, because once you get to a certain age, now you're accountable for your own, your own self. And once I hit, you know, 15, 16, 14, 15, 16 years old, it was up to me to seek that kind of stuff out. And I had good people around me, 
but I refused because I was too busy doing other things. So I never searched to try to find out what it means. How do I really get to heaven? How do I know I'm going to go to heaven? I didn't search that stuff out because it didn't mean enough to me. What meant enough to me was this. I was making money. Um, I had some good friends. I was working at a bank. I had respect, or so I thought. I'm living in a big town. You know, I got all these gals that, you know, whatever. It just starts to feed your ego. It feeds your pride and your arrogance, all right? And that's where I was at. I had no foundation other than my own self. I was my own foundation, and that's dangerous, extremely dangerous. And plus, not only that, being in Grand Rapids, having all that money, uh, and hanging out with people, I and mean, they were probably good people, nice people, but maybe not the best influence, maybe not the best people to be around, uh, some of them, I, I started drinking even more than what I was doing when I was in college. Okay, I was drinking four or five days a week, but I was a functional alcoholic and that I was still working, I was never late, always did my job, okay? I had a nice apartment, I paid my bills, I had, you know, I, I could function, but I was drinking a lot and I was fornicating a lot and I was being a jerk a whole lot to a lot of people, namely family, okay? It's like I, I felt as though I'd outgrown my family. You know what I mean? I, I you know I'm I'm better than them. They're still in that little town up north. I'm in Grand Rapids. Whoop de doo. But that was my mindset. Okay. So I, I drank a lot. I mean a whole lot. However, in 2003, I met my first wife. We were married, um, and this is the year that my son was born. All right, 2003. And so at that point, I knew that some things had to change. So I stopped drinking. I was able to do that. Thank God. Uh, however, um, because I still had no foundation, I still had no idea what I needed to know about salvation or whatever else, I could try to raise my, my son up the best I could. I could try to instill good values in him. But really, I didn't even have it in myself. I didn't have the, the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I didn't have that. I didn't even know about it. I wasn't even pursuing it. So how could I pass that along to anyone else? I couldn't. I couldn't. And because I had none of that foundation, and because I was accustomed to uh, being on my own, having this pride, this inflated ego, this money, all this stuff, I was not a good person, okay? That marriage would fail. My first marriage failed. Now, I'm not gonna take all the blame, okay? It was both of us, but I would say it was mostly me. Definitely mostly me. So that marriage failed, and my son was probably only three or four years old. So now my son has to grow up in a divorced situation, which is not ideal. It's not ideal, uh, but I could justify it because I could say, well, even though I'm not living there anymore, I'm still gonna be a good dad. And I think I did okay, but I could have done a whole lot better for sure. But again, I, I was consumed with me. It was all about me, okay? So moving forward, I, I would meet a couple of gals that I would have long-term relationships with. And the, the interesting thing is that they, I believe, truly were saved, okay? I was pretending to be at their level. So they didn't, they didn't know that they needed to explain to me what this was. They thought I was already there because I could fake it really well. I was acting like a Christian, okay? Um, and, and so I could pull it off well enough um, so, that, so that they felt that they had uh, an equal in, in a relationship because these gals wanted to have a Christian boyfriend and I could play that role really well. I knew just enough to make it sound convincing that I knew you know, that I was at their level, that I was saved. I could pretend all those things. 
those relationships never ever worked out because eventually the cracks would show and they would see that I wasn't who I was pretending to be. I wasn't at that level. I had a horrible temper, okay? And my temper would flare, I mean bad, badly. And when I would start just spouting off at the mouth saying these horrible, hurtful things, they could kind of put two and two together and like, yeah, I understand that, you know, Christians are vulnerable to these things too, but the level that you're going at, I don't think you're who you say you are. And they were right. And those relationships would fail. And I'd go through a series of girl after girl after girl looking for something that I could not obtain because I wasn't who I was pretending to be. When you're just going through the motions, when you're just pretending to be something that you're not, it will always crumble. It will fail every time. People will start to see through you the better they get to know you. When people get to know you, they can determine if you are who you say you are or not, okay? You can be the best actor, you can be the best con man in the world. Somebody who is truly discerning and is around you long enough, they will eventually see who you really are, who you really are, okay? And that was my problem. That was the problem. Well, I met a gal, and I won't say her name again, but she and I got on really well. And I was truly, at that point in time, really trying. Now, I wasn't trying as hard as I should because I still didn't know anything about this. But I still, I, I believe in God. And I know Jesus died for me. And I know I need to keep doing good things. This was my rationale. I'm gonna stop drinking. I'm gonna stop being so arrogant. I'm not gonna put so much focus on money. And I thought, well that's, see I'm doing better. I'm a good Christian. I'm stopping these things. And that relationship worked out for a while, but again, because I wasn't true, because I was just pretending, because I was just going through the motions a lot of the time, eventually she figured it out. We were scheduled to be married. Okay, we were, we were gonna get married. We were about a month away from the actual wedding date, okay? And this was in 2008, I believe, 2008, 2009. And uh, we, were, we were due to get married one month before our wedding date. I don't remember what happened, but I lost my cool. And I just went off, and I mean off. I wasn't so much yelling at her. I was so angry at God for whatever like any of that was even his fault, but I was so angry. I was taking his name in vain. I was talking about how he couldn't help me, how she was a fool for even uh, putting so much faith in this. And at that point, she realized I was not who I said I was. And so she left. I never saw her again, and I can't blame her for that, but I was devastated. Now, I knew it was my fault because I had gone off like that, but I also knew uh, but I also didn't want to accept the fact that she left. I was so upset. I, I really loved her. I liked her. And I wanted to be married to her. But I wasn't the person I was pretending to be. So it would have never worked out anyhow. But when she left, I, in my mind, said, you know what, God? I did all those things. I got rid of the love of money. I got rid of my arrogance. I wasn't fornicating. I wasn't doing all those bad things anymore, God, and you still took her away from me. And so I was mad. I was mad at God for a little bit. I mean, I got past that. But I made a promise to myself, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change for anybody. I tried that and it didn't work. So I became arrogant again. I became very proud. I was obsessed with money. And that leads me to right here. 2010. 2010 is when I met my wife, my wife now, okay? Um, I wanna make sure I, I, I'm following my notes. So far, so good. I met my wife, my wife now, in 2010. And again, she had a Christian background. I think she knew more about salvation than I do, or I did at that time. Um, so I think she had that foundation. Again, I'm still going on this surface knowledge that I had because I never, 
I never put forth the effort to learn more. So I'm still thinking, I believe in God. This Jesus guy died on a cross for me. My goods outweigh my bad. I'm going to heaven. Okay? And again, it's easy to make excuses for your sins. And I remember my, my wife and I, before we got married, we moved into this house together. Okay, so I have my son, and she had uh, she has four kids, but only three were living at home. The other one was older, so she was already out on her own. So um, we move into this house. You know, my son comes every other weekend, or you know, uh, every other week throughout the summer. You know how visitation goes. But her kids were there all the time, except for when they'd go to see their dad. Okay, so we move into this house. We're not married. But I remember lecturing the oldest daughter at the time about how she should not fornicate with these boys at school. And she should not do this and should not do that. But the one about the fornication was just so blatantly hypocritical. Here I am telling this 15, 16 year old girl that she shouldn't be fornicating, that she shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that. Meanwhile, I'm living with her mom unmarried. You know what I'm saying? That was my mentality though, but I was so proud and so arrogant, I could justify it by saying, but I'm an adult. You're only 16. There's a difference. And in a way, I guess that's kind of true, but it's still sin, whether you're an adult or, or a kid. Uh, but the, pro the proud, arrogant me wouldn't recognize my own sins. I would use the Bible, again, to point out everybody else's but I would never ever recognize my own. So I was very proud, I was arrogant, and I became a real jerk, but like with a capital J, jerk. I did not treat my wife well. Now eventually in 2011, okay, 2011, finally, my wife and I got married, okay? And, and, and you know, we had started going to a church down the road from us, okay? And I think that being at that church is when the seed was finally truly planted in me because this was a good Baptist church. And the pastor talked about salvation and being saved and about the blood of Jesus, okay? So I started to hear these things that I'd never heard before. Now, I'm not saying that I accepted it and I jumped on it and I grasped it and I held it close, but it was there. It was floating around above my head, okay? I, I was still too proud and still too arrogant to actually implement it, but I was starting to hear it. The seed was being planted. So in 2011, because we did feel convicted, I finally felt at least that convicted that we're going to a church, but we're not even married. And I thought, this, that doesn't seem right. So it was starting to shift. So we got married, okay? The problem was, that was the reason, that was the only reason I got married. At that point, I didn't have a true love for my wife. I didn't have a true respect for my wife. Because, again, justifying my own um, poor behaviors and poor decisions, even though we were married, I was still talking to other gals. Even though we were married, I would stay uh, late at work to, to talk to some gal and flirt and do whatever else. Meanwhile, my wife's sitting at home, okay? But I could justify it because, um, again, I'm not as bad as that guy over there, okay? I'm not as bad as that, that gal over there. I could still justify it. And talk about hypocrisy. Going to church, playing the good Christian while at church, and I, you know, I'm, I, I was volunteering to do the website for the church, Again, thinking, see, I'm doing good things. So long as my good things outweigh the bad, I'm all right. Okay? Going to church, playing the good Christian, pretending while there that everything is great. I'm a godly man. Uh, you know, I love reading my Bible. The truth is, I hadn't opened my Bible in years. and still wasn't. Except when I wanted to point out somebody else's sin and justify it with a verse. Okay? So I'm pretending to be a good Christian at church and at home, I'm treating my wife like junk. Just absolute disrespect. Talk down to her, mean to her, um, basically cheating on her, although never physical, but still, uh, Jesus said, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Um, 
And like I said, I was talking to several girls, some were like past girlfriends, and then I would hide it, and then she would find out, and this is what I would do. This is what I would do. I would find a way to turn it around to make it her fault. That's what I would do. I would make it her fault and justify my behavior. Well, you know, if you would just do this, then I wouldn't want to talk to those girls. You know, if you just did your hair a certain way or wore a little more makeup, then I wouldn't want to look at those girls. Horrible. That, that, that's who I was, okay? So the, 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 the problem was is that I, I wasn't faithful because I wasn't content. Because I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. Yeah, I want to have the wife and kids and a home, but I also want to come over here and explore my options with Mary and Susan and Jennifer and, uh, you know, whomever else, whomever else. I wanted to have both. And, okay? That's a problem. That's a huge problem. And that's a tremendous amount of disrespect. And my wife knew that she had her suspicions anyway. That this stuff was going on, this stuff was happening. Like I said, she would find my phone sometimes, read through it and see these messages and be like, what's this? And then of course I would find a way, or I'd make threats. So I knew my wife wanted to be with me. I knew she loved me more than I loved her. So I just say, well, you know what, if you don't like it, I'll just leave and you go your way and I'll go mine. I knew every time if I said that, it would strike fear in her so much Okay, I'll drop it. Just, just don't leave. Please don't leave. I, I, I feel like, an, it's hard for me to talk about this now because I realize what a horrible person I was. Horrible, jerk. Didn't deserve the woman that I have. Okay. So, anyway, that carried on for a couple of years, but everything started to come to a head around 2012. Okay, I'm running out of room here, so I'll write it over here. 2012. Through a series of bad decisions and a series of bad um, uh, actions and whatever else, things really started to unravel. I mean, everything just started to unravel. Uh, my wife was finding out more and more about who I really was. Okay, um, and through a series of bad decisions, I lost my job. Lost my job. We ended up losing our home. Okay? Um, I, I ended up alienating um, my kids. I ended up alienating a majority of my family, my friends. The only person, I shouldn't say the only, the one person who stood by me when she had no reason to, could have easily just walked away and washed her hands of all this this mess I'd created was my wife. The one that I disrespected, the one that I was not faithful to, the one I wasn't content with. And by content, I mean, like I said, I wanted the home life, but I also wanted these gals over here. Um, I felt like uh, I deserved that, okay? The one who put up with me for two years at this point was in, 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 in knew all of my faults, okay, all of my arrogance, my pride, my sins. Excuse me, the one who knew all of that still stood by me. Why? I don't know. I still don't know. Uh, I just know that I appreciate that she did. Um, the family, I told you, I had alienated a lot of them because of pride, arrogance, because I have money. Um, the people that I would not have lifted a finger for if they'd fallen on hard times, those very same people, when I fell on hard times, did everything they could to help me. Again, uh, what do you even do with that? The very people that I shunned, the very people I looked down upon, like I said, I wouldn't have lifted a finger to help any of them if, if they'd fallen on hard times. When this hit, they were there, okay? Like I said, we, we were flat broke, had no, no money, no job, no home. You know, our cars were close to being taken back, whatever. 
And my family, they stepped up. They stepped up. They helped me. And they had no reason to. My wife, whom I had been unfaithful to, who I had disrespected and mistreated and talked down to, she had the opportunity to leave. She didn't. She stayed. Why? Again, I have no idea. I, I don't deserve it. Didn't deserve it. Okay? So anyway, um, when bad things like that happen, when everything just starts to come down, you come to a point where people call it like a crossroads. Crossroads. Okay? Uh, I don't know. I'm not a good artist, but crossroads. And the, and the point is, is that you, you have two decisions, okay? And if you're here, you know, you can turn left, you can turn right, or whatever. And at that point, I had two, two choices I could make. Uh, I could get mad. I could blame God. Um, I could get worse. I could lash out. Um, and and don't, don't get me wrong, that stuff crossed my mind. Like, God, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen? Yes, I've done these bad things, but I'm doing the website for the church. I go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. You mean to tell me that's not enough? No, it wasn't, because I still hadn't come here. Yes, the seed had been planted. I had been made aware, but I still didn't make an initiative to actually get to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I didn't do it. I was still doing it on this scale system. And even though I was doing all this bad stuff and I acknowledged in my head that it was wrong, I wouldn't acknowledge it to anyone else, I still felt, but I go to church on Wednesday, on Sunday, I pay my bills, I go to work, you know, I'm doing the church website, um, I, I, I've done other things to help out at the church and whatever else. So what? Who cares? I wasn't here. And God had to get my attention somehow Again, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called to his purpose. Okay? Romans 8.28. I didn't recognize it or know it then. I know it now. Okay? God wanted to get me to a better place. He wanted me to get saved. He loved me that much. And he knew that eventually I would be receptive to it. He knew that already. He already knew that someday I would get saved. That's why he was working on me. But he also knew that to get me there, he had to bring me down a few pegs. In fact, probably a few hundred pegs. He knew he needed to get me as low as I could get. I mean, hitting rock bottom. And when you're at rock bottom and you're looking up, like I said, two choices. Get mad and blame God, or acknowledge that I am a horrible person, that I've done things my way and it hasn't worked out. And now what I need to do is turn this way, hand it all over to God, get right with God, and let Him take control. Those are my two choices. And obviously, I, I at least was smart enough and um, uh, humble enough to make the right decision. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here doing this video. So, on March 11, 2013, when things were at their very, very worst. Because this was bad, but it got worse here, or prior to this. I finally got to a point where I said, i got to let go of this pride, this arrogance. I have to stop thinking that I deserve certain things. I have to stop thinking that I can have all of it. I have to stop um, treating my wife as though she's an option. Okay, I have to stop, um, uh, you know, chastising my kids for the things that they're doing when I'm doing the exact same thing. I can't, I can't do this. Not if I'm going to be a sincere person. Not if I'm going to get to where I need to be. So I got, I had to let go of my pride, the arrogance. I, in fact, it wasn't just about humility and being humble. I had to be almost, in a sense, I needed to be humiliated. Okay brought to the very bottom, okay, all the times that I looked down on people because they didn't have money, they didn't work at a bank, they didn't go to MSU, all that time, and now here I am at the very, very bottom, and all the people up here, who I once used to look down upon, are now reaching out, trying to help, 
They're trying to help me. These people are trying to help. Why? Namely, my wife. And it was finally at that point that I fell in love with my wife. Not just because she stayed with me, even if she would have left, and she had every right to. Even if she would have left, I would have been heartbroken because I finally, on this day, when I came to Jesus, because I heard these things, I at least had a little bit of that knowledge, <clears throat> but finally I was implementing it here in my heart. When I came to Jesus on March 11, 2013, that is the same day that I finally fell in love with my wife and began to appreciate her. And my whole mindset changed. Now, I'm not saying I became perfect overnight. I'm not saying I'm perfect now. I still have a temper that I struggle with. I still have a mouth that I sometimes need to really take a really big cork. Okay. Sometimes I still fail. I still slip. Okay. But, I, but I'm a whole lot better than I used to be. And I hope to get even better tomorrow and 50 years from now. But I finally got to a point where I realized that I couldn't talk to somebody that way and expect that they'd just be okay with it, that they could, that they would accept it. Not just my wife, but people in general. I, I couldn't talk down to people anymore. It wasn't right, but also I can't do that and then call myself a Christian and be a good example for others. I knew I had to change everything. I had to start from ground zero and work up. And thank God I realized that because otherwise I would have gone, I would have gotten worse. Had the bad stuff not happened in 2012, I wouldn't have gotten to this point. And I'd still be on the road to hell right now, at this very moment. And who knows, maybe, maybe something would have happened to me and I wouldn't, would never have gotten saved and I'd be in hell right now. I don't know. But I finally, at this point, realized that I needed a savior, that I needed someone else to take control, that I needed to not do things my way, but to do them God's way. So I, I started talking to some people. I actively pursued, this is the difference, I actively pursued people that I knew were good, solid Christian men who knew their Bible, okay, who were rightly dividing. I started to put all this stuff together. I knew I could go to certain people and they could lead me to this. And for the first time in my life, I finally understood what it meant to be saved, to trust on the blood of Jesus, to understand the who and the what. I finally started reading my Bible, not as a cursory glancing through the pages type thing, but digging in deep. Digging in deep. I wanted to know. I wanted to know as much as I could because I was on fire for Christ. Like I was talking about in my previous video. I got, I was, when I got saved, boy, I was on fire. And I hope I still am. Sometimes my jet's cool. Sometimes I backslide, whatever else. But on the whole, I try to stay on fire for Christ, okay? And from March 11, 2013 forward, I just kept growing and growing in Christ. I started talking to people and, and um, learning as much as I could from them, okay? And, and then I, I found that as much as the churches I was going to, as much as they had helped me, I soon got to a realization that I'm not getting any farther. It's kind of like when you get to second grade, what if, what if um, you never got to progress past second grade? Even though you're like 18 years old, but they're still trying to teach you about, you know, the alphabet. And they're still, you know, okay, we need to talk about the differences between the different colors. You know, this one's red, this one's orange, this one's blue. I felt like I was outgrowing what my churches were teaching. And that's not arrogance. That's not pride. That's not me. Oh, look at me. I'm so great. No, it's just that when you get to a certain point, you need people that know more than you so you can continue to grow. And I wasn't getting that at the church that we were going to. 
and we would search out different churches and I'd always walk away like all they ever talk about is Jesus loves me in a lot of these churches when they're talking about salvation they keep talking about this sinner's prayer or they keep talking about I have to get baptized and, and I knew enough at this point that that stuff wasn't true why are they teaching that or why aren't they teaching? Why are we digging in deeper to the Bible? Why are none of them talking about the blood? So I, we stopped going to church. We stopped. Because there was no point in going someplace and not learn something. And not walk away fulfilled. Yes, there's fellowship, but guess what? I can go, and, and we do. We go to a, a good friend's house. Uh, uh, every, every Wednesday we go and we have a Bible study. So we have that fellowship, okay? My wife and I, we have fellowship. You know, we'll, we read the Bible together and we'll talk about things and we watch things on TV. And you know, as bad as the internet can be, as bad as YouTube can be, there's still some good there. I have found a couple of great men on YouTube that I've learned so much from. So much, I've learned much more from them than I learned in my entire whole life before that. Okay, and I don't know if I should name drop or not. I, I think I will this time. I don't usually do this, but Robert Breaker. Is a guy that I've learned a lot from, especially in terms of the blood. The blood, the emphasis on trusting on the blood. I also thank him, Robert Breaker, because he introduced me to dispensations, which made the Bible so much easier for me to understand. As a new Christian, I was on fire for Christ, and I was trying to read and learn as much as I could. And I knew that there were these apparent contradictions. And namely, the one that hung up on me, or I got hung up on, was the difference between Paul and James. Paul is saying salvation is by faith alone, and James is saying, no, faith without works is dead. You have to do works and faith in order to get saved. And they're like, well, which one is it? And these people who didn't teach dispensations would try to uh, reconcile the two, and it just sounded like mumbo-jumbo. It just sounded like, what? What you just said makes zero sense. Which one is right? Well, they both are. Well, if they're both right, then they're saying opposite things. How does that work? Well, you know, you just got to have... And it, it, it would be some stupid, lame explanation and I would never get anywhere. Thanks to Robert Breaker who taught and teaches about dispensations it made sense. Now the Bible I, I knew there were no contradictions and I knew the Bible was, a, was without error but I couldn't reconcile that until dispensations. Once I, I could wrap my head around dispensations and see where they're at, where we are then the Bible started to make sense to me. The other guy is Kent Hovind. Now I do not agree with Kent Hovind's uh, teaching that the church will be here for the tribulation. I don't agree with that. But again, chew the meat, spit out the bones. Kent Hovind, thanks to Kent Hovind, I became a King James Bible believer. I became a King James only because of Kent Hovind. Because of Kent Hovind, I could understand that the earth is only 6,000 years old and therefore what I've been taught in school was a lie. I could, I could, I now realize that dinosaurs coexisted with man and it all made sense. His teaching, if you, if you get a chance to watch his creation science seminar, you should watch it. It's long, it's about 18 hours, but watch it over a few weeks. Whatever you got to do, it will, it will reconcile faith and science because they do go hand in hand. There's not a contradiction between the two if you're talking about real science. The Bible talks about science falsely so-called. That's the evolution crap, okay? This guy, Kent Hovind, brought me to an understanding where I could defend my Bible, okay? My King James Bible. So I thank Kent Hovind for that. He's the one that also um, uh, introduced me to and, and confirmed eternal salvation. That you cannot lose your salvation. Now, Robert Breaker believes that as well and has helped to, to 
uh, give me more arguments for that as well. These two men, I have learned more from these two men than all of the churches I've ever gone to. And I'm not disparaging those people. Uh, the church we went to when, when my wife and I first got together, like I said, it was a good Baptist church. And that pastor taught me quite a bit. He got me to a good level. The problem was we never got past that level. And as I wanted to grow and get, you know, and, and, and move forward, they, they always stayed right there at a very remedial level. And every church that I've gone to since then, like I just said, same thing. We're going to go this far and no farther. Well, I can't do that. I, you know, and yes, I can I can study the scriptures for myself. That is true. But when you think about it in the terms of I got saved in 2013. It's 2021 right now. That means I'm eight years old. Okay? I'm eight years old. How much do you expect from your eight-year-old? Would you expect your eight-year-old to uh, be able to fix uh, a space shuttle? No, of course not. So at eight years old, yes, I still need, and will always need, no matter how old you get. But especially now, I need people that know more than I do to help me because there's certain things I don't understand. And thanks to these two guys, okay, I've learned so much, all right? Another guy that I want to point out, and I, I haven't watched a whole lot of his stuff yet, so I won't give a blanket endorsement, but of the few that I've seen, he seems to be on par. Gene Kim, another guy. Now, I need to do a little more research on him and watch more of his videos before I just put a stamp of approval. But I do like what I've seen so far. But Robert Breaker and Kent Hovind, yes, absolutely. So, to wrap that all up, my point is this. As I grew as a Christian and started to really appreciate what Jesus did on the cross, when I came to realize that my salvation was death, burial, resurrection, trusting on that atoning blood, that's when things really started to change for me. I didn't care about money anymore or pride or arrogance. You know, I don't stress about things anymore. You know, we've fallen on hard times since I got saved. I knew just because I became a Christian that not everything is going to get better now. We fell on very, very hard times after I got saved. To the point where in 2017, we were so down and out, we lost our home, we were living in a camper in my parents' backyard. That's how bad it was. Um, I couldn't find work. I couldn't find work. So I finally just said to myself, you know what, if I can't find work, I'm going to create work. And I started my business, uh, Sonic Boom DJ. Uh, we moved to my, like I said, 2017, we moved to my parents' backyard in a camper. I started my business. We had very little money, but my wife had faith and confidence in me, so much so that we took what little we had and I bought some equipment. And I started my business, Sonic Boom, and God has blessed it tremendously, okay? It grew fast. It grew quickly to where I was. I had to buy more equipment and I had to hire people to help me do these, these things, these, these events, these weddings. Uh, but for a while there, before that happened, we fell on some hard times. That's okay. I didn't stress about it. I didn't stress. I turned it over to God. Now, that doesn't mean I just sat back on the couch and just, well, you know, let God take care of it. I think that, you know, we, we should do what we can. And I did. I was praying, I was turning to my wife and asking, what do you think? And I didn't use, ever used to do that, okay? But I also, I, I took initiative. Like I said, okay, they won't hire me, they won't hire me, they're not hiring, the economy is garbage, I'll make my own job, I'll hire me. And so I started my own business and it grew. And now we have a nice home, we have nice vehicles, I'm in a great band, I have the business still, my wife has a great job, we still fall on hard times sometimes. Stuff happens. When you become a Christian, things don't... It's not like all the bad stuff disappears. It's not a magic wand. Okay? Uh, you, you will still have trials and tribulations. Things will build up and down, up and down. 
the difference is, even though the times may change, up and down, up and down, up and down, your joy, that's different than happiness, your joy should remain constant. Or if anything, it should get better, but it should at least remain constant. No matter if I'm in good times or bad times, my joy is still right here. I'm not going to stress about things that I can't control. I'm not going to stress about uh, lack of funds if that happens, or if the car breaks down, or what is that person going to do? Or It's in God's hands. Whatever is supposed to happen will happen. Now, I'm not a fatalist. I'm just saying we have to recognize there's certain things we can't control. And, you know, like here. We know that all things work together for good. Good and bad, it will work out for good, okay? And I don't care what happens. If we lost our home, if we lost our cars, if we lost all of our money, if we lost our savings, my business, whatever, my faith and trust in God remains constant because this all is going to pass away someday anyhow. It doesn't even matter. This stuff is temporary. That's what you need to wrap your head around. This stuff is temporary. It's going to go away. It doesn't matter. What matters is out here in eternity. And where are you going to spend your eternity? Are you saved? Have you humbled yourself? Have you, have you uh, gotten rid of your pride and your arrogance? Do you realize that you need a Savior? Do you understand that it's not a checks and balances system. It's not Santa's naughty list. It's not about if your good outweighs your bad. It's not about if your sin is less offensive than Bob's or Jennifer's or Sally or whomever else. None of that matters. Have you come to a point where you can put away your pride, your inflated ego, and understand that the only way you're going to get to heaven is to come here and trust on the blood of Jesus. Have you gotten to that point? If not, I pray you will. I pray that you will. Because this is the only way to heaven. Trusting on the blood of Jesus. Knowing who he is and what he did. Excuse me. But I said all of that to say this. You can use your testimony too to, to encourage others to come here. Um, I am extremely blessed because like I said if we lost everything I have God I have my wife now I have my family too okay and, and I'm very appreciative of my family especially because like I said I mistreated them for so long okay but they were there for me and now I hope they know I'm there for them I hope they've seen a difference in me I hope okay uh, but what it really comes down to, if I have God and nothing else, I'm good. Now that's a bold statement, and a lot of people can say that and mentally think that, but do you mean it? Can you say that from your heart? If you lost everything, your wife, your kids, your family, friends, all your material possessions, but you still had God, would you still be happy? Would you still have joy? Would you still trust? Okay, I'm not saying you can lose your salvation. You can't. But would you backslide? Or would you just grow stronger in your faith? Could you still look up there and say, God, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've lost everything, but thank you. Because guess what? I have eternal life. And that's really all that matters. So if I have God and nothing else, I'm good. I'm good. Now, I would like more than that. Of course. I want my wife with me. Of course. I love my wife. Okay? So... But if my wife and I, we have God, and if my wife and I have God and nothing else, we're good. We are perfectly fine. Because we've hit bad times here and here. Okay? Before I got saved, after I got saved. Bad times. Doesn't matter. Can you say the same thing? Well, you can if you're saved. Those of you who are not saved, when this all passes away, when it all burns up, when it's all gone... What do you have? What do you have? See, I used to think that this is what mattered. If my bank account is full, if, if I have a nice car and a nice house, then I'm content. I'm good. Well, what happens when you lose that? Well, then you hit the rock bottom, and, and like I said, you go into despair. You have two choices to make. Thank God I made the right one. But I could have taken another path. 
and end up in a worse spot. All right? What do you have if everything leaves you tomorrow? If your wife or your husband left you, if your kids never talk to you again, if your friends and family shun you, nobody will hire you, you have no car, you have nothing. Do you have God? Because if so, you still have enough. You have more than enough. If you don't, then what do you have? You can have self-reliance, that's good. We should all have that. But you know what, sometimes even self-reliance isn't enough. I want something more. I need something more. All right? So anyway, I'll wrap this up just by saying thank God. Thank you, God, for everything that has come into my life, good and bad, for everything that brought me to this point. Thank you, God. Thank you to my wife who stood by me, even though I was the most, probably the worst husband on earth for a good two years probably. Thank you to my wife for standing by me and continuing to stand by me, even when I still sometimes go off. You know, I, I, like I said, I struggle with a bad temper, but I'm a lot better. Um, so, I, and thank you to my family and my friends who stood by me. I, I don't deserve any of it, and that is humbling, and that's where you should be too. We all need to be there. Be humble. Know that we deserve zero. That's what, <laughs> and that's what it is. This is what you deserve. Zero. Anything above that is a blessing. Okay? That's what you deserve. Anything beyond that is a blessing. Okay? I want to encourage people, if you're not saved, please get saved. Trust on the blood of Jesus Christ. If you are saved, are you still on fire for Christ? Are you living? Are you being a Christian. Don't act like one. Are you living as a Christian? Are you reaching out to people who are not? Are you witnessing? Are you handing out tracts? Are you sharing videos like this? Because that's what we all should be doing. All right? All right. Like I said in the previous video, these two videos, the one that went up Thursday, or will go up Thursday from my perspective, and this one here, are the prelude to um, the series I'm going to be working on, which is going to be the life of Jesus. And I'm talking about all-encompassing. I'm going to try to cover as much as I can. It's going to take a lot of work, but that's okay. That is more than okay. Every time I dig into the Bible to present one of these for everyone to watch, I learn something too. Every time I go to Bible study on Wednesday with my sister and my, my good friend, Bully Jean, and her, her lovely children, and my wife, and Josh, when he can be there. When we have that Bible study, I learn from them. Hopefully they learn from me. Hopefully we're all learning from each other. But that's what this is all about. Surrounding yourself with people you can learn from. Surrounding yourself with fellow believers. Fellowship is important. And if you found a good church, I'm not discouraging you from going. I'm just saying in my area, I haven't found one. But that's okay. We are the church. So going to church, if you can, good. If not, that's okay too. Like I said, I've found who my, these are the guys that I consider to be pastors to me and my wife. We've learned so much from these two guys. Like I said, and from, from Gene Kim as well. But especially Robert Breaker, Kent Hovind. Highly recommend you watch their videos. Like I said, I'm not in competition with anyone. If you want to watch their videos instead of mine, so be it. Just please get to this point. If you want to watch their videos in addition to mine, that would be great too. Just please find someone who is rightly dividing the Word of God, who is using a King James Bible, and believes it from cover to cover. That's all I ask. That's who you need to find. Whether it's Kent Hovind, Robert Breaker, Gene Kim, myself, or whomever, just make sure that they're doing what God wants them to do. They're teaching God's Word. All right? Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, please subscribe to my channel. Please like this video. Please share it. I appreciate it so much when people do that. Send your questions and comments uh, in the area below or email me or find me on Facebook. Um, that's it. 
Have a great day, and God bless you.